The following interview was conducted with Willis A. Tacker, the Professor of Basic Medical Sciences uh, School of Veterinary Medicine for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, March the 2nd, 2009 in Stewart Center, B26. Welcome. Good well, afternoon, Dr. Tacker. Thank Let's you for having with, me. Let's start with your uh, parents and where and when you were born and your siblings in early years. Well, I was born in Tyler, Texas. Uh, my mother was uh, Texan, so was my father. I have one half-sister, and uh, she's a good deal older than me, about 14 years older than me. And I grew up in the Texas Panhandle. Uh, so... Well, tell us about early school and tell us about high school, too, as you go. Well, early... I went, actually, I went to first grade in a little town called Clarendon, Texas, and then we moved to an even smaller town called Wheeler, Texas, and I was there from uh, second grade through high school. Um, I went to Baylor University in Waco, Texas for a bachelor's degree in biology and then went to Baylor Medical School where I got my MD degree and my PhD in physiology and biophysics. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about college. Were you uh, activities and athletics and did you live on campus and your program and then go into the medical school? How did you decide to go on? Well, actually I decided when I was three years old to go to medical school. Uh, I had uh, an asthma attack. Mom took me into the emergency room and the physician gave me a shot and all the trouble went away and I decided right then I want to be able to do that. And so I had planned to be a physician really all my life. Uh, as far as Baylor goes, mostly I studied. <coughs> I was uh, not, I just didn't have time to be into music and sports and that sort of thing. I Did was, you live on campus? Pardon? Do you live on campus? I did live on campus for two years and then off campus for oh, two okay. years. Okay. What was the size of the school then? Was your class a good size? Oh, yeah, it was several hundred in the class, a few hundred. I don't remember exactly how big Baylor was at the time. Mm -hmm. And then, as you said earlier, you went on to medical school. I did. That's okay. right. And then what came next? Uh, move into work, your contact with Dr. Well, after... after yeah. After medical school, I went to Rochester, Minnesota to the Mayo Clinic where I did an internship in medicine. And then I had prearranged uh, to go back to Baylor Med School to go on the faculty. And so I moved, we moved back to Houston and uh, I was teaching there. I had known Dr. Geddes throughout medical school. In fact, I met him the summer before I started medical school. That would be 1964. Uh, because I took a course that he taught in the summer, and I liked the course, and so I struck up a research project with him, and I guess now after 44 years, is that right? Yeah. Uh, we're still working together on stuff. Yeah. Did you go into, you went into teaching, you didn't, go, you didn't want to go into practice? Well, I was torn, uh, and I decided that I didn't want to do another four or five years residency in order to practice full time because I did want to teach and I did want to do research. So I, what I decided to do was go back to the medical school, teach and do research, and I did what is called a locum tenens practice. That is, if a physician wanted to leave his town for a three-week cruise, then I would go fill in for him while he was gone. And so I did do that. I also practiced here at Purdue a little at the student hospital. Okay. Were you married by that time? Did you meet your wife there in Texas? Oh, yeah. Texas? Uh, met my wife while I was in medical school. And uh, that was in, in fact, I met her in 1964 also. Okay. Good. Now let's talk about, you know, how you happened to come to, you came to Purdue with Dr. Days. Let's talk about the early days of the Biomedical Center and how that came about. Well, the way it came about from my standpoint sure. is uh, Dr. Geddes uh, came up to me one day and he said, Tack, I've been approached by the Dean of Engineering at Purdue University. He wants me to go to Purdue and establish biomedical engineering there. And I told the Dean that I wouldn't go by myself, that I wanted to bring a team. So the Dean said that might work out. And Dr. Geddes said, I would like for you, he said, you're one of the people I'm going to ask. In fact, he said, I won't go unless you go with me. And so I thought it over and talked it over with Martha and decided, well, this sounds like an exciting thing to do. And there were actually four of us that came, Geddes and myself, Joe Borland and Charlie Babs. 
uh, and we set up shop in August of 1974. We came in and there were four desks, four chairs, and four telephones, but the telephones didn't work. So we went out to the Holiday Inn and had uh, business out there, and then Tuesday morning when we came in, they had hooked up the telephones and we were off and running. Where was that located initially? You were not in the Potter, we're not in Potter. No, we were in the basement of the Double E building. Uh huh. And prior to that, uh, there was that first symposium on biomedical engineering that you, this is in March before, and he didn't come until the fall of 74. It was the first one that was held at Purdue. Do you recall that one? I do not know oh, about that. Okay. Uh, I saw I, it in a news release, that's why. That would have been in 73? No, it said uh, it was March of 25, 1974. I'm unaware of that. Yeah, okay, prior before you came. The, yeah. Was um, one of the names that I saw in some of the research I did, Paul Stanley was the acting head? Paul Stanley was the acting head when we came. So the department, there was some some organization of There some was a bit of organization. Okay. Uh, Bill Hillenbrand of Hillrom Corporation had provided funds to get this going and he did it based on uh, really Paul Stanley's contributions. They were having trouble with electrical noise from hospital beds and that's what Hillrom made. Sure. Paul Stanley solved the problem and so uh, Bill Hillenbrand said, well I, this is wonderful, I'd like to get graduates, people who can do this. So he, uh, I guess, talked to the dean or someone here at Purdue, sure. and they set up to have a biomedical engineering center. It was not the biomedical engineering department at the time. Uh, and Paul Stanley was the interim head until Dr. Geddes came. All right, okay. <clears throat> and then the, um, the, so the Baylor team, well, tell them about some of your research and how you got started on that. And then I know it was changed to the Hill and Brand in 1985, mm -hmm. the biomedical. Well, the, uh, the way we got started is, as I said, we came in on a Monday and when things got hooked up Tuesday, we sat down and said, we must do certain things. We need to teach, we need to have a research program, and we need to find ourselves some graduate students. And we went to work and I would say within a very short period of time, we had lined up a course to teach and agreed on who would teach what. We had found a couple of graduate students uh, and we had some research funds that we brought with us from Baylor and Purdue provided some funds also. So we had enough to get going and we began writing grants like crazy so that we could sustain ourselves. Sure, right. And you, by the, uh, had, you were in the Potter Center by that time you moved? No, we oh. were not. We were in Double E for about three years. And I would say before we ever moved to Potter Building, we were up and running and had really gotten everything settled. When we came, we knew the Potter Building would be built and that we would go into it and that Double E was a temporary home. Sure. But it took a while for them to get the building done. Right. How was the funding, sources of funding in those days? It was a little bit easy or? Well, well, no, it okay. wasn't. As a matter of fact, we had no, except for Dr. Geddes, we had no guarantees at all. Basically, Purdue said, uh, in order to have funds, you get grants. This is hunting for money, and we will provide you with a hunting license. And so we had a hunting license, and we went out, and we hunted real hard, and we brought in our own money. Good. That sounds okay. Um, th then in, uh, then the, the department was established in 1998, the, uh, the Department of Biomedical Engineering, the graduate program, yes. is that right? Yes. Uh, and then you, by that time you were the director? Well, it was actually before that time okay. that I was executive director. Um, the Hill and Brand Biomedical Engineering Center had a director, and when Dr. Geddes retired, I was appointed director, a co-director and was director until I took a leave of absence to move out to Seattle because a company wanted me to come out and do some work on defibrillators. Uh, I went out and did that for a couple of years and I would fly back to Purdue to teach and to go to basketball games because I had season tickets. And uh, after two years the company got sold and so I had to decide what to do and in fact I lived in Seattle and I commuted back and forth to Purdue because I enjoyed teaching so much, especially teaching the medical students. And as you know, IU has a medical school. Yeah, I was going to ask here. you about that. You've been uh, doing that for some time. Since 74. Yeah. Okay. In fact, that was, that was 
really the only requirement that I specified when we came. So I told Dr. Geddes, I will go to Purdue if I can teach medical students. And they had had a, the IU program here for about two and a half or three years at that time. So we met with Lindley Wagner, who was the director of the, that program, and he said, oh, I'll take all the help I can get. So I've been teaching the medical students since we came. All right. And originally there was only the first year, but now it's the two years. That's right. They went from one to two years right. uh, later on. Do you also teach in the vet school as well? I did teach in the vet school for several years. Uh, physiology is what I taught over there. Uh, and in fact had an appointment, it still do have an appointment, mm -hmm. basic, basic medical sciences in the vet school because uh, I was, uh, the physiology pretty well transferred between humans and animals, except for a few systems. You can, if you can teach one, you can teach the other. Right, okay. And now then, now it's the, um, you tell us a little about the research that you've been involved in, and also that consulting. And one of the ones I want to ask you about is that motor system evoked potentials. Okay. Yeah. Uh, motor evoked potentials, this is a test which is done for patients who have neurologic disease, uh, the major one being multiple sclerosis. And it's a diagnostic test whereby in a case where you can't be really sure from the patient's symptoms and the physical exam, then you can do motor evoked potential or auditory and visual evoked potential studies and establish the diagnosis better. Now, I got interested in this because I was working with a neurosurgeon and I had some good friends that were physicians who worked in that area. And we did a number of research projects on motor evoked potentials. Uh, as a matter of fact, motor evoked potentials are not done much anymore because better tests have come along that pretty well uh, make the diagnosis without having to do those. But I did do that and a number of graduate students got their dissertations done on motor evoked potentials. It's very simple. You stimulate the skin and you record the nerve impulses that appear in another location in the body. And the nerve uh, signal that you get may vary in its timing. It may be rapid on one side of the body and delayed on the other, for example. And if this is asymmetrical, it's a strong indicator from MS, that okay. the patient has MS. Okay. Okay. That, that really ahead. was not the major research emphasis for me. My career has really been based on CPR and defibrillation of the heart. Uh, but I would branch out from time to time sure. into other well, there's things. There's another area that you were into, too, that um, the motor, the um, uh, motor, the uh, um, the, uh, the associate director then at that uh, time with the MEPS, and wasn't there another area or more the defibrillation? Talk a little bit about that in a little more detail. Well, the defibrillation. Uh, research, you had the personal monitor and communicator. Oh, was personal another, personal yeah. monitor and communicator was right. a project done for the military. And the okay. military decided they needed a device whereby they could evaluate the status of a soldier remotely. In other words, if a soldier was down 300 yards or 900 yards away from anybody, they needed to be able to tell was he alive and was he in good shape or bad shape, injured and so forth. So we developed a remote telemetry system uh, for uh, the Army and uh, developed prototypes, built prototypes, tested it ourselves out on the Purdue golf course where the terrain was kind of irregular and it was hard to tell what status someone was in. We got it all done. We shipped the devices off to San Antonio for testing and then the Army had a crisis come up and so they put the devices in a warehouse and nobody has heard from them since. Although an interesting thing has happened, Dr. Geddes told me just last week that he has seen that the military has put out a request for proposals for a system to do that. And now it would be extremely easy to do compared to the way we did it because of the global positioning system and the satellites. We didn't have any of that to work sure. with. Oh, that's it. It's, they just put it and never got field tested at all, huh? That's right. Oh, my goodness gracious. Now they all of a sudden they're coming around again, right? <laughs> well, they need it again, and that old technology would not be suitable right now. Sure. They got it. They've got another upgrade then. Uh, when you were the executive director of the center, what were some of your challenges and responsibilities when you were there? 
Well, uh, I guess my view was that the most important thing the center did was produce graduates. Doing research, publishing, getting grant money is important and in fact is mostly what people are rewarded for at the university. But my own personal opinion is that the real product of the university is the student. So my stress was on recruiting high quality graduate students, providing them with good experiences, and then helping them get located in jobs where they could make real contributions to health care. So I would say that uh, throughout the time I was in administration, I continued to teach. I also did research, but I also had a number of graduate students, and a number of those were MD, PhD students because I felt like someone who had dual qualifications would be equipped to tackle certain problems for which only one discipline really didn't give them all the tools they needed. Right. But we were beset with space problems and money problems and staff problems and uh, all the things that they other come people along. Are, that's yeah, right. they, yeah, that's part of management. And then the you university. continue to, work, to teach over in the, um, the uh, med center. Yes, I taught medical students throughout. Right, okay. You never taught anything in Indianapolis, just the campus, just the one here? Just the one here. Okay. Yeah, I, may, I gave a few lectures down at Indianapolis, but nothing yeah. really of any consequence. The center has changed a lot now that it's, it's, a, it's a, actually a school. You know, the Weldon School of Biology. Oh yes, yeah. mm -hmm. and they got their new facility and things of that sort. But you're not you're not involved with that so much anymore. I am. Well, it turns out I am involved because oh, okay. uh, uh, biomedical engineering came to Charlie Babs and I uh, about a year and a half ago, and they said we got a real need. We need a course uh, f on systems physiology, medicine, and pathophysiology, and we don't have a, such a course. And I'm not sure if they didn't have faculty with the background to teach the course or if the faculty were too busy or what was go going on, but it is a course for which an MD degree is very, very useful. You don't have to have it, but you almost have to have it. And so they asked if Charlie and I would teach this course. It's a second year course for biomedical engineering students, a required course in the curriculum, and Charlie and I taught it last year and we're teaching it again this year and as a matter of fact I just came over here from lecturing to those students. Yeah. How many students do you have in your classes? Uh, there are about 60. Okay. And they started with 60 and I'm not sure they may have added or dropped a student sure. or two since then. Right. Okay. Um, the uh, You were talking earlier about the defibrillators. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the additional research that you're working in this area? Well, we did a lot of research on defibrillation, both, and of course this is restarting the heart that has stopped beating and right. this causes sudden death. We worked on the external defibrillators like they have in airports where you can put the electrodes on the chest to shock the patient. And we also did work on the internal defibrillators which are surgically implanted in high-risk patients so that if they have sudden death, the device will shock them back to a beating heart rhythm. And this was, this has been probably 75% of my research career. I think one of the uh, really sort of important things that happened is early on, when we first came here, there was no place in the country, in fact in the world, to present research data on this subject. We would send, we'd do the research, we'd send our papers in, uh, for a presentation at conferences, and they just were unresponsive to them. They never accepted them. So I went in one day and I said to Dr. Geddes, I said, Dr. Geddes, I want to take a risk. I want to hold a conference here at Purdue, a defibrillation conference. It'll cost money. I don't know if anybody will come or how many people will come, but I think we ought to do it because I think it's an important subject. And he said, well, do it. And so we held the first one, about 70 people came. And Where'd you then, draw from your, the list that you went out? Where were the people? Medical oh, these school? were people, we surveyed the publications in the area and uh, contacted the people who had published papers. And we also went out to the companies that manufactured the equipment. And we went out to the leaders in emergency medicine around the country at the big hospitals and we just told them we were going to have this conference and would they come and pay a small fee to attend. 
And they said yes, and we ended up having a number of those. Uh, and it's interesting because if we hadn't done that, I think CPR and defibrillation in the U.S. at least, maybe worldwide, would not have developed as quickly. Now, it would have still developed because the need would have been there. But I think that those conferences really kind of galvanized the research community and I made a lot of friends with people Good outside context. of Purdue and the contacts, they became friends with each other and sort of a mass effort arose from that. Yeah. You worked with the, did you work with some companies and instrument yes. makers? You needed equipment for this too, right? Uh, we did, uh, although uh, we built the critical equipment ourselves. Uh, we, there's a fellow named Marvin Hines who's over at Indiana Wesleyan University who had been at Baylor with us and we recruited him to come over in the summers to build a device and it was really the biggest, most flexible, most useful research device we had. But in addition, we did get equipment from the manufacturers, uh, Physio Control, uh, MRL, Zoll Medical. These people made defibrillators. Medtronic later on was the big player right. on the implantable right. units. And you're still doing research in this area today as well? or? Uh, I'm doing a little, not a whole lot. I've branched out into other things, and as a matter of fact, the uh, the field is immense. Now the American Heart Association holds annual big conferences on CPR and defibrillation. And as I have gotten interested in other projects, I just haven't spent as much time, but I follow it closely and I do a bit of consulting on defibrillation sure. still. What about professional associations? Talk a little about been, which ones have you been active in? <clears throat> Really, most of my activity as far as really being an active member of an association was with AAMI, Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation. This was a group that got started about the time we came here, and they were interested in medical device development. Uh, because of my interest in defibrillation, uh, I was invited to be on the program committee for annual meetings and then was invited to be on the board of directors and then was invited to be the president of the organization, which I was uh, eventually. And so I would say AAMI has been my major professional organization. Mm -hmm. Do they have annual meetings? There's they right. do have annual meetings. And yeah. uh, What about the symposiums that you, do you still have them here at Purdue that you started? Well, uh, no, I don't. Well, that's hard to, I'm not involved in them myself, right. but there are, a number, of course, Purdue has symposia sure, all the but time. But I mean on the biomedical, you started those. Uh, uh, the, one, the subjects on which we had symposia are no longer held, and the reason is they're now held on a nationwide basis, and so there's not really a need for them anymore. Sure. People can get their stuff presented to big audiences uh, conveniently at American Heart and places yeah, like that. Yeah, they got those sections in there, that's right. <clears throat> the, um, uh, one of the, uh, you got the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering. You were the inaugural fellow in that association. That's right, that was a later association right. forming up. I was one of the original people and I think that was based on my activities in AAMI. Since I had done that and since I had held the conferences the people who formed AIMB, which is what AIMBE is sure. called, uh, invited me to be a fellow, and uh, it was really quite an honor uh, to get to do that. Did you yeah. know a little bit in advance that you were going to be here? How did they? I sometimes ask those questions. Sometimes people are surprised. Sometimes they're not. Depends. It varies. Well, I guess I, you know, I was kind of young, and I didn't know what was going on. I was not especially surprised. I didn't anticipate it. But uh, as you get older, you begin to differentiate. Into You sort of learn when you ought to be surprised and when you don't. <laughs> when you're young, you just, you know, you're swimming as hard as you can and something comes along, you take right. it and exactly. move on. Yeah. Let's talk a little about family. Oh, uh, okay. And you, you met your wife when you were in Texas. That's right. Yes. Okay. Uh, married. I have three daughters. One of them is married, and I have a granddaughter. Uh, that family lives right here in Lafayette, so we get to see them frequently. I have another daughter. That's the middle daughter. The, uh, her name is Betsy. 
Uh, Sarah, the oldest daughter, also lives in Lafayette. She works in Lebanon right now, so we get to see her a lot. And the youngest daughter is Catherine. She lives in Portland, Oregon, where she is in her third year of residency in psychiatry. So she's the one I don't get to see near well, as much. Did she get her MD degree? And yeah, she she's in it, got an MD degree okay. and has gone into psychiatry. Okay. Did any of the children come to Purdue? The first two, the oldest and the second one, did come to Purdue, but Catherine, the youngest one, did not. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why. I think she just had itchy feet. And the other part of that is we had decided to go to Seattle at the time she graduated from high school, so she didn't have the tie of us being here. She ended up going to Colorado State University. And then since we were in Seattle, she went to medical school in Seattle at the University of Washington. She could have gone there or gone here, but we were residents of Washington, so she went where the tuition was cheap. Sounds good. <laughs> um, let's see. Tell us a little about what, as you look back on the 70s when you came, what the campus was like when you came. Well, what was housing like for you, or where did you live when you first well, came? Well, housing was good for us. We found a really nice place to live out in, uh, uh, oh, it's kind of near Cumberland Avenue, uh, corner of Grant and Cumberland. Mm -hmm. uh, we really enjoyed living there. Housing, I think, is great in Lafayette because you're so close to the university. It's so easy to get around. Right. Uh, we then moved closer to campus uh, and closer to the high school so that our kids could walk to high school. Uh, I believe that was in 1983. And we enjoyed living there. That was, that was really a good place to live. Uh, I, I view living in Lafayette as a wonderful thing. It's very handy, too, to a lot of things. Oh, uh, yeah. Chicago or Indianapolis, and oh, yeah. plus the things around here. And of course, that's grown. The city is, the county has grown a lot. Uh, everything's grown. Right. <laughs> what do you, uh, let's talk a little bit about biomedical engineering. How it's, how do you look at it as you look back, for, say, from 20, 21st century? How do you think it's changed? Well, biomedical engineering is really a non traditional engineering area and always has been. It's characterized by the medical component. So you can be a biomedical engineer and you can be involved with mechanical or electrical or aerospace or civil or chemical engineering uh, or systems engineering. There are a lot of areas and all these get lumped together. The advantage is it's very diverse and you get to work with a lot of different people in a lot of different areas. The disadvantage is that virtually anybody who wants to can call themselves a biomedical engineer whether they are capable of solving a differential equation or not. And so you never really quite know from a person who says I'm a biomedical engineer what they're capable of doing. On the other hand, if somebody says, I'm an electrical engineer, there's a set of assumptions I can make about their expertise and what they've been through, or chemical or civil or whatever. So it's kind of a grab bag. And as a result, it has a very wide variety of people and disciplines in it. When we entered in biomedical engineering, the device uh, development was really the major thrust and it is probably as big a thrust now as it was then, but other areas have come along, such as cellular uh, technologies and micro technologies, nanotechnologies, and these are other forms of engineering which are not really device development. So it's gone from, I'd say, 80% device development when we started, down to perhaps that's now 20% of biomedical engineering. Mm -hmm. are, they, are they affiliated with any medical schools across the, uh, is there any tie-in with some of them or not, uh, biomedical or not? Uh, well, yes. Okay. Uh, a number of them have extraordinarily strong ties, and Purdue has what I would call medium strong tie in that the, there are a few people like myself who lecture to the IU medical students here, and we also lecture in biomedical engineering. But Purdue does not have a large number of medical students. There are only 32 on campus, so it's not a big program. Now, I had three students that were MD, PhD students, got their MD here and got their PhD here also with me. And uh, I had a few that were also MS MD students, 
but there have not been very many of those mm -hmm. at Purdue. I think because uh, the medical student program is fairly small, and until recently, biomedical engineering was also pretty small. Right, That's, and of course, it's it's grown. It's, it has field, grown. The field is growing. Yeah. What are some of the people with that combination MD and PhD? Are they are going to teaching, or are they going to practice, or does it vary? Yes. Oh, okay. It's all over the place. All right. Uh, I have, for example, my students. Uh, I have one MD PhD who's now a neurosurgeon at Vanderbilt. I have another one who is an entrepreneur. I have another one who's a lung transplant surgeon in Indianapolis. I have one that's uh, uh, a pediat emergency room pediatrician and device developer in Seattle. So some go in business, some go in practice, some go in this teaching. Quite a few avenues that open There's up. There's a lot of avenues. That's right. right. Yeah. Let's. Uh, do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? Um, favorite Purdue tradition. Would you like to share? Or some tradition? I don't think I have a, a okay. real. Do you participate? Do you go to you go to well, basketball. You go to the athletics things. I used yeah. to go to. I used to have season tickets to football and to basketball. Sure. I don't have season tickets anymore, and but I do go to the games kind of on a onesie twosie basis. Uh, I guess the reason for that is I just have so many things and so little time. Uh, but I. I enjoy the athletics, and I, that's a great tradition. But there's a lot of great traditions. That's right, exactly. Produce, like so. the, the Boilermaker Special, for example. Uh, yeah, I campus. just yeah. There's a lot. I, right. I don't think I can pick <laughs> out one. How about a outstanding event in your life? Does you have one of those? Outstanding event. Um, I'd, I'd like to briefly have two. I'm going to separate them into it, personal and professional. Can and have as many as you want. The, well, it can be singular or plural. Uh, the the per personal one is the outstanding event was when I met wa the woman that I eventually married because it has just been fabulous. She's also a scientist and we do things together and she understands all my problems and it's been a great partnership. So that's the personal one. The you know the pro I think kind of the outstanding professional thing was something I de uh, just described to you a while ago, and that was identifying a need, which was there's no place to present CPR and defibrillation research, and it's really important, and just doing what it took, which was to get out there and have a conference, see how many people came and whether it was worthwhile, because that blossomed into multiple conferences and multiple devices and multiple medical applications. Uh, so that probably was, in retrospect, the most important single event. Yeah. Very good. Now the ball's in your court. Do you have any closing or some comments that you'd like to make that you think about as you look back and look ahead? Well, uh, what would I like to say? I would like to say that what I have enjoyed the most in my professional career have been teaching students and working with competent people. And I had the absolute joy of working with Les Geddes and Charlie Babs and Joe Borland for decades. And after we came to Purdue, we added on technical people. Uh, this would be Bill Schonlein, Jim Jones, George Graber, Kirk Foster. These were the first ones, and there were many that came along after that. But working in a team effort with people like that is just fantastic. I am not a loner. I like to do it with people. And, and I think that that really is what made biomedical engineering a success at Purdue from the time we came, 74, I would say, up until mid-90s or uh, approaching the turn of the century. Right, right. And it's grown, too. And it's grown, right. yeah. Uh, it's different. And in fact, it's when we were a small group, 
uh, everybody could work together, and I enjoyed that greatly. I, I have to honestly say that it's now a larger group, a lot more competent areas, but the people don't work, they don't get down in the lab together with the, each other. They're mostly working with their cadre of graduate students and so on. Uh, that's another and very enjoyable way to do it, but I think given the choice, I would prefer to do it the way we did it with a smaller group. Good. It's like the difference between living in Lafayette or New York City. You know, do you want to live in a small town or do you want to live in a big town? That's right. And I've lived in Seattle and I know the advantages and disadvantages of both and I'm living in a small town now. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Dr. Tacker. This oh. has been very nice. I appreciate that. Well, you're welcome. Thank you very much. And I enjoyed it a lot. <laughs>